is going to come and, and just share what's on his heart. And uh, Thank God for him. Amen. He's getting ready to go on the mission field. And, and uh, praise God. He's, he's a real blessing to us. Amen. So, Brother Pastor Mike, come on up. His wife, too. Can't leave her out. She's a blessing, too. Can't leave her out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless the name of God. God is so good. Hallelujah. And he's an awesome, awesome God. And uh, in preparing uh, for my time to, to go on the field, I have been really every night, you can ask my wife, every night, uh, most of the night, <laughs> In deep, deep into the, the, the wee hours of the morning, I have been really on my face seeking the Lord, praying, uh, asking God just to reveal himself to me in a, in, a, in a real powerful way. And he's been speaking strongly to me. <clears throat> if anybody has had that experience where you just get alone with God and you give him opportunity, he will speak. And he'll answer those cries that are in the deepest recesses of your spirit. And what's really on your heart will, will come forth. And he, he knows just exactly what you need, when you need it, and he speaks directly into where you're at. And I praise God for that because I'm hungering after him. And uh, there's something that's burning inside of me. And it's not just because I'm going on the field, but I think uh, it, it's just because of, of the time in which we find ourselves. It, it's because of uh, what we have been doing here in seeking his face, praying, crying out to him. It's because of what God desires for us to step into and to be. Uh, more than anything else. It's a realization to be everything God wants me to be. And that should be our heart's cry. That we come into God's presence saying, Lord, I want to be everything that you would have me to be. For your honor and glory, I want to magnify you. I want to glorify you. I want to be to the praise and glory of your name. Because we were created to glorify God. We were pre created to magnify him. More than anything else, somebody said to me, Pastor Mike, how do you know what the destiny, you talk about destiny, you talk about purpose. How do you know what your destiny is? How do you know what your purpose in God is? Everybody, every one of us has a destiny and a purpose. And for all of us, our destiny is to glorify God. The reason we were created was to bring glory and honor to him, to magnify his name, to be the praise and glory of his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are his workmanship, Scripture tells us, created in Christ for good works, for the purpose of showing forth the praise of the one who's called us from darkness into his marvelous light. We've been called by him to be alive at this moment during this time to bring glory and honor to his name, to reflect back to him the glory that is due unto his name. Praise his holy name. <clears throat> and so it's in that vein tonight that, that we're going into this particular passage of Scripture, and that God had me there, and, and I love this passage of Scripture because we're going into that time of year. And so I'm in the, the first chapter of the book of Luke, and uh, it's going to be a little bit different than maybe what you think this message may be about. <coughs> uh, I want God to have his way. Everything that he speaks to me, I'm going to give it to you just like he gave it to me. And I hope that you love me still at the end of it all. <laughs> Praise God. I have been, one of the reasons that, that I have been so heavy in my spirit is because of what I see happening around us. There's a spirit of confusion that is unleashed, especially in this country. Forces of darkness are, are just, just uh, having a, 
a heyday. They're, they're wreaking havoc, not only in this nation, but among people. I, I see a, a, a spirit of confusion even in the church and, and a spirit of the world that is so prevalent in the church. And, and I believe it's because we don't give ourselves to know him. We don't give ourselves to honor his word. We don't follow his word. Much of the time, we give ourselves to our own vain traditions. And we never ask hard questions. We just assume, because we've always done it that way, that it should be done that way. And the greatest problem is found in the church. Because we do so much in, in the church that isn't founded or based on God's word. It comes out of traditions of men. Many, many things. And Jesus pointed to the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious people of his day, and he, he had an open dialogue with them about the very same thing. I got a problem with you because of your traditions, because your traditions, he was saying in Matthew and in, and in Luke, your traditions, they, they make void or they nullify my word. You hold your traditions in higher esteem than my word. You would rather follow after vain imaginations. Give yourself to things that are not real. We, we have a spirit of fantasy that is unleashed in the earth. And I see it so prevalent in the church where we're chasing after things that aren't real. We come into relationships even and we think it's supposed to be like Hollywood or what's proclaimed, you know, on the big screen rather than real life. Real life isn't like the movies. And we have this weird, weird idea of, of the way that things are supposed to be, sadly, especially in the church. And God has just been speaking to my spirit that we are to be people of truth. The apostle said there's no greater glory, no greater honor than to know that my children are walking in truth. And Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth is important because it's the truth that will set you free. Amen. Pilate said, well, what is truth? How do you know truth? God said, my word is truth. This is true. Every word is true. This is truth. <clears throat> and we are to give ourselves to the truth, to know the truth, to walk in truth, to be children of the light. Because he's called us out of darkness. We didn't come out of darkness to walk in confusion. We didn't come out of darkness to be blind and to walk and... and, and um, no, he's called us into the light. And light exposes. It exposes the darkness. And it makes real the truth. Makes real the truth. <clears throat> and so tonight, we're going to look at this passage of Scripture in the light of God's word. And you know, what is amazing to me, people say to me, how, how do you know how to interpret the word? And I, say, and I say to them all the time, the word interprets the word. It's no great mystery. God says what he means, he means what he says, and that's it. And he expects that we would follow and believe and adhere to and long after that thing, follow after it. But we don't. And that's where we get into trouble. <clears throat> because a wool has been pulled over our eyes. 
many times, and the gospel has even been veiled to us because of our own unbelief, the scripture tells us. Faith cometh by, and hearing by. <laughs> so you can't have faith apart from the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing. <laughs> hearing and ad hearing. <laughs> you, you hear, and then you ad hear. <laughs> I hear it, and hearing it makes me adhere to it. Makes me follow after it. Makes me long for it. Makes me walk in it. Makes me desire it. Amen? Amen? It's supposed to. It's supposed to. It quickens in us because this word is alive. Hallelujah. Hebrew says it's, it's, it's quick. It's sharp. That means it's alive. It's alive. It's real. Sharper than any two-edged sword, it pierces, cuts, divides, exposes, this word does. Hallelujah. 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 No greater power on the face of the earth than it is than the word of God. God created through what he said. He spoke the word and it was. Brought everything that we have into existence, everything that we experience is because God says it is. Hallelujah. And the eternal truth of God's word comes from God's breath, comes from his own mouth. Remember, there were two trees in the garden. One was a tree of life, that if you ate of its fruit, you live forever. And there was another tree that looked good, probably smelt good. We find out in the passage that it tasted good. And it was desirable so much that if you ate the fruit, you would become wise. So how could something so good, or seemingly so good, be so bad. And yet, when you eat that fruit, the wages bring death. Because it brings death. There's a way that seems right to men, but the end thereof is death. So we must, as believers, follow the truth and adhere to the tree of life. This is the tree of life. This is the fruit that we are to live on, feast on, give ourselves to. Because this will produce in you life. It will manifest in you the presence and anointing of God. God's word always accomplishes whatever he sends it to accomplish. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. Amen. His word never returns unto him void. Hallelujah. It will do exactly what he purposes it to do. It heals. It delivers. Sets people free. When you adhere and take from this fruit. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of God. There are wonderful things in this book. Why then would we desire anything else? Why then do we chase after counterfeit? Why then do our hearts yearn for something that isn't real? What is it? What is the lure of the world? Is there really anything out there that can even compare to the wonder and splendor of God. No, it's a facade. It's a lie. It's a delusion. And it's sad that many believers, or people who call themselves 
believers because I believe if you're really a believer, you set your face to seek after him. And anybody who seeks him finds him if you search for him with all your heart. If you desire him, he will be found of you. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. You cannot have communion with the Spirit and be led astray. Because he's the Spirit of truth, and his job is to lead us and guide us into all truth. So the trouble is we don't have communion with him, and we don't give ourselves to know him. And today... We must. I have said it before, and I'll say it probably for the rest of my life. The Apostle Paul, during his time on earth, he looks down the quarter of time in the spirit. He sees our day, and he said, oh, in that day, that's a troublesome time. And he's looking at our day, our time, where we are alive right now, and he's, I'm sure, I'm sure it's exactly what he saw when he said it. Because it is a troublesome time. It's a confusing time, a perplexing time, a wicked time. Because men's hearts are drawn to wickedness. They're drawn away from God. They are drawn to their own pleasure. Self-seeking and self-serving. And they are drawn away from him. And that's the day we find ourselves. And the sad thing is, the last church age spoken of in Revelation, that's the, the age in which we find ourselves. Whether we like it or whether we don't, that's the age in which we live because Jesus is coming soon. There's not a whole lot of time. Scripture is being fulfilled before our very eyes. And the culmination of all things is at hand. Jesus is coming soon. And he's coming for a bride who has prepared herself and made herself ready for his return. But most of the church is under this Laodicean spell, this lackadaisical, can't make up the mind whether they want to live for the world or be, oh God, everybody wants the blessing of God. Everybody wants to be healed and everybody wants to be well and everybody wants to be rich. Everybody wants to have everything that they need. But how many will give themselves to know God, follow after him, Hunger and thirst after righteousness. How many really give themselves to know him? And that's the day we find ourselves. You see, this Laodicean spirit is alive and well. But it's a spirit that chases after the things of the world. And it's a sad thing that God has given us over to the very things that we chase after. And he has indeed sent that delusion and allowed us to believe lies because we do not love the truth. So we are to be people who follow after truth, adhere to truth, and love truth. Amen? So this passage of Scripture is a wonderful passage of Scripture. I love the Gospel of Luke. And of course, it starts out in a very, very, familiar, very familiar to us. We'll begin probably like in the fifth verse of the first chapter, and we'll read just a little bit. And I might stop in between. This is going to be kind of like a more of a teaching, although I'll preach it sometimes probably because I'm a preacher. But it'll be more of a teaching than maybe what you are used to as a preaching. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. Now that is very significant. Because Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, who was descended, she was a daughter of Aaron, who was 
the, the head of the Levite, the Levitical priesthood. And so these, these are, they come, both, both of their families come from the lineage of the priests, the Levites. And so Zechariah is a priest. Elizabeth is descended from the priesthood herself. And he is of what is called the division of Abijah. What is the division of Abijah? Well, the divisions, or in the, the original it says course. In the King James or the New King James, they might say the course of Abijah. Well, the courses or the divisions were the workings of the priesthood, their duties and service that they performed while they were working in the temple. And these courses or divisions, a course was seven days. So they ran concurrent, weeks upon weeks upon weeks upon weeks. And according to the course that you belong to or that you came from or descended from, that was when you did your service in the temple. Service in the temple, according to the priesthood, began at Passover because that was the first of the Levitical year. Not of the natural year, but of the Levitical, the priesthood. The service of the priests began with the first feast in the spring, early in the spring, and that was Passover. So everything begins at Passover. So the first course would begin on Passover. And every course would follow a week after that, and a week after that, and a week after that. And so if you go into 2 Chronicles, uh, no, 1 Chronicles, I'm sorry. 1 Chronicles 24, verses 1 through 9. You'll see there the different courses that are mentioned. And if you go down to the course of Abijah, there it says Abiah, but it is actually Abijah, A-B-I-J-A-H. The course of Abijah is the eighth course. That would be eight weeks from the time of Passover when Zechariah was actually in the temple, before the altar of incense, performing his priestly duties, offering incense on the table of incense before the veil there, before the holy place. He's praying and worshiping God, offering incense in the temple when the angel of God appears unto him. And it's during the course of Abijah, the eighth course. Now that's very significant. Because seven sevens are 49. So the 50th day begins the eighth course, or the eighth week from Passover. And it's very significant for those of us who may call ourselves Pentecostal, because 50 is Penta, and a feast took place on the 50th day, which we are very, or we should be, are very familiar with. Isn't that right, sister? Of course. Amen. Because we, are, we call ourselves Pentecostals because it was on the day of... Oh, hallelujah. It was on the day of Pentecost. What is Pentecost? Pentecost was a feast. So it was on the day of the feast that the Holy Spirit fell. And believers were filled with the Spirit. And, and you know, hello, from Acts chapter 2. Amen. Well, it was during that feast that Zechariah was in the temple. He belonged to the course of Abijah, and that was his time. Imagine, prophetic, that is his time to do his service in the temple. And so he's in the temple on the day of Pentecost. Now, this is some 30-some years before, of course, because Jesus is, has not yet come, and so he has not yet died and given himself. And so the day of Pentecost, we're not talking about when we talk about the day of Pentecost, but Pentecost is the feast, okay? The actual feast that the Holy Spirit fell on or came down on in the book of Acts. It was on this very feast. And guess who was in the temple at the time when, you know, you get it. <laughs> so Zechariah is in the temple, and something miraculous happens. You know this account in, in the story here. What happens? 
something very special happens while he's in there. Now, there's a, they, they had a problem here in Elizabeth. They are well advanced in years, and she's barren. And in those days, in particular, if a woman was barren, it was a great reproach. And no doubt it weighed heavy upon them because there was no heir for them to leave anything to. And, and, and a woman in those days, if she wasn't able to give birth and to produce an heir, to carry on the lineage, she was looked at as useless. That was her purpose. And her purpose wasn't fulfilled if she were not able to have a child. And so they're well advanced in years, well past the time that uh, for childbearing years, well beyond. They're elderly, old, older than my brother Bob. They were old, <laughs> older than we are, sister. <laughs> they were old, elderly, well advanced, the scripture says, in years. Well past. In the natural, you would think, game over, hello. <laughs> Can you imagine when the angel shows up and speaks to Zechariah and declares to him, you're going to have a son. Now, Jesus, now you're going to, now? We are well advanced. How is it possible? Humanly, there's no way, it, it, it's not humanly possible that we could even, never mind Sarah, we're talking about old Zechariah, poor thing. There's no way, man. He's probably looking at himself going, are you kidding, God? <laughs> I will need more than some, never mind. <laughs> Spiritually, I mean, my God, can you imagine they had probably lost all hope. They had probably come to a time in their life when they just said, you know, we've just got to resign ourselves to the fact that's never going to happen. Humanly possible, it, there's no way. It, God can't, can't, can't do it now. We, it, we are well beyond. Never mind have the patience to look after a child now, take care of a child now? Am I going to be able to nurse in my old age? Hello? Take care of a child now? There's no way. And so I imagine they had given up all hope. And how many of us have had dreams and visions? And I thought to myself, you know, there are things that I'm desiring longing for, hoping for, believing for. And time goes on. And sometimes you feel like, oh man, did God forget? Did, will, he, will he remember me? Will he remember the promise? Will, will, the, will I ever see what he's promised to me? Will I walk in what he said I would walk in? Would I experience and, and have and be everything that God called me to be. And there are sometimes after the passing of time that we can get kind of like come to the place where we get just resign myself. Maybe it isn't going to happen. It's just too much time has gone by. Too much water under the bridge. Too many things in the natural have happened and it just doesn't look like so I must just, uh, just better to resign yourself to the fact that it's not going to happen. And just when they lose, come to the point where they just about lose all hope, God shows up. And God comes on the scene. And God says, Brother Zacharias, it's not over until it's over. It isn't over until God says it's over. And when God says it, you can believe it. And so when he 
hears the angel, he doesn't believe in his heart. Because the angel says to him, because you didn't believe, I'm going to strike you dumb. You're not going to be able to speak now until this child comes forth, until the child is born, until the promise is, until you see this promise come to pass. You're not going to be able to speak because you didn't believe. So even in his heart, he probably questioned, man, does this guy, did you lose your address? Are you sure you're talking to the right person? Am I the right Zacharias? <laughs> because in the natural, it does not seem that this is ever going to happen. But yet, Bible says in due season, there's a time in God's timetable, his timing is not the same as ours. We get confused. We get perplexed. We get impatient. We want to hurry God up and move God along because God just, he must have forgotten. He doesn't know that all these things and these obstacles need to, and God is working it all. There's a time for every purpose under the heavens. And in God's time, it will be. It will come to pass. And there they are, this elderly couple. And so, Zacharias is in that temple, and the people are wondering, uh-oh, this guy has been in there. Are those bells still ringing? Can you hear them? Because he's been in there a while, Something going on in there. Nobody dares go in there, you know, because they're just waiting for, to hear the bells, and if the bells stop, then they'll just pull them out by the ankles, you know, because they got a thing tied to the ankles, a rope, so that in case somebody, because if you went into the presence of God, hello, and you weren't right, or, or you know, you held rega regarded iniquity in your heart, uh, you did service, in a wrong motive or whatever, you could lose your life. And so they got a little concerned out there because he took so long, but then all of a sudden the bells must have been, been, been going and here he comes and now he's unable to speak. And then the Bible says that Elizabeth hides herself for five months. I imagine she didn't know what was happening to her in her old age. I imagine she is, she is bewildered. She is perplexed. She is amazed. She's overjoyed, but she's going, oh God, I'm old. <laughs> what is happening to me? Now, I've never been pregnant. But I have been very close to somebody who has been pregnant. And there are a lot of things that begin to take place in the life of a woman and in the life of a man. <laughs> when they are in that family way, <clears throat> attitudes change, you know, emotions change, all of that. Can you imagine at her age? going through all of that. And yet, here she is. And so she hides. She, she's like, I ain't, I'm not even going to be dealing with the neighbors and everybody else asking the questions and what's going, what's going on with these two in their ripe old, hey, Zechariah. <laughs> and he can't talk. <laughs> Something's going on, man. And they, nobody knows what's going on because she, she hit herself. <laughs> for five months. But in the sixth month, something else powerful happens. Now, the time of Pentecost, it's, I told you, eight weeks from Passover. All right? And so that would be the end of May, the beginning of June that we were, we were talking about where Zechariah is in the temple. 
You move ahead six months, say from June 1st. You move ahead because, I say June 1st because this coming Sunday, when I'm flying, um, it be, Hanukkah begins this, this coming Friday. And so that's why I say probably around the, the 1st of June because it's right at the time in which we find, the time of year, in which we find ourselves right now. Because we are just coming up on December. Can you believe it already? <coughs> Everybody says, yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> I know. Things are changing quickly, man. The seasons just seem to go by so fast. It seemed like yesterday I was on my porch in the summer, basking in the sun, feeling so good. And then all of a sudden it got cold and my bones started aching and things started happening. And seasons just seem to change so quickly. And so here we are, six months later, now in December, at this time of year. There is a young maiden who is a virgin in the town of Nazareth. Oh, there it is right there. <laughs> the angel Gabriel, the same angel, by the way, <laughs> same angel that went and spoke to Zechariah, is the same angel that now is going to speak to Mary. And you will find, in talking about the Feast of the Dedication, or Hanukkah, which we are coming up on, and which the church today has lost revelation of, sadly, because it is a prophetic feast, and an anointed feast, and everybody says, oh, yeah, but it's not found in the Word. Well, that's where you're wrong, because it is found in the Word. If you go back into the book of Daniel, the eighth chapter, Daniel has a vision, and he sees this vision. And what he sees and what is portrayed before him is actually prophetically telling him there is coming a time when the enemies of God will arise and they'll come against my very own people. And just in a time when you think all is lost and all hope is gone, God will come on the scene. In a time when darkness just seems to prevail and the light has gone out. At that time, God's glory is going to appear. And he will shine. And the scripture will come alive like never before. Daniel prophesied. And do you know the messenger who came and spoke to Daniel at that time? I'll give you a clue. He's the same one. <laughs> same Gabriel who went so many years before and gives Daniel a timeline. Daniel is praying, seeking God. He's, he knows, man, I've been in captivity here for 70 years in this place. And Jeremiah said it's going to be 70 years, and then God's going to deliver us. We're going back. He's going to fulfill his word. Just when you think all is lost. God comes through. He fulfills his word. So he's praying, seeking God, crying out, fasting. And he says, I'm praying. And I'm crying, God, I know. It's been 70 years. You're going to fulfill your promise. And he's crying. And he's praying. And he's pleading. And here comes Gabriel. He said, you know, it took me a little while because I was a little bit delayed. <laughs> But I'm here now to tell you, God has heard your cry, and he is about to come on the scene. And let me show you, brother, what is about to take place, not just in your day, but in the latter days. Let me show you what will happen. And he speaks, and he goes, and I'm not going to go into too much about Hanukkah now. We're going to do a series, I think, right? 
maybe after the first of the year, where we'll go in depth with each feast and whatever, because there's a lot of information, and I don't want to get you bogged down. But I do want to make you aware of this passage of Scripture and what we should be emphasizing on in this passage of Scripture. It is the time in which we find ourselves right now, and the angel is speaking to this virgin, and he gives her a message. What does he tell her, Mary? <laughs> Ah, yes, there he is. Hail Mary. You are highly favored, and the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women. The Lord sees you, Mary, and he has chosen you above everybody else. Sometimes I think that we give her a bad rap. Because, um, you know, some, some would, would worship her and make her co-redeemer with Christ. And, of course, we know that's not scriptural. She's a woman. Just like everybody. She's not divine. Hello. She was born in sin just like everybody else. She had a mama and a daddy. We know who they were, right? We know her, her brothers and all of the rest. We know her family. <clears throat> But she's chosen by God. And she believes the word of God. God comes and says, I've chosen you. Out of all the women on the earth, I've chosen you. I've got my eye on you. My hand is upon you. Something very special is going to happen to you. You're going to have a son, but not by human means. The spirit of God himself will overshadow you. And the one who's been, who is to be born inside of you, he'll be the Holy One of God. He'll be the Son of Eternity. God's own Son. Can you imagine? I can't even begin to imagine. First of all, she is exposed or engaged to a man She's going to be married to. And in that day and age, it's not like today, because in that day and age, if you were found to be unfaithful, that was a cause to, to put you to death. If it was even rumored that she, there was any hint of infidelity, she could be stoned. And I don't mean... I mean, like, pick up rocks stoned, hit you in the head and die stoned. She could be dead. So at the risk of her own life, she's got to believe God. And she's got to stand, even when everybody is probably, you know how people are, especially in the natural. What? Who? Who's going to believe? Listen, Joseph didn't even believe until God spoke to him, said, hey, don't put her away. <laughs> She's telling you the truth, Joseph. <laughs> but he took it, that same one, he was busy, that, that Gabriel. <clears throat> that same one came and had to speak to him and, and reveal to him, or else she would have been put away. Thank God he wanted to put her away privately. Didn't want to cause her to have great shape because he loved her really loved her, but he believed that she had been unfaithful. He didn't believe her when she told him, well, first of all, she told him that she was with child. Because she believed the word of God. And so she told him, hey, an angel came and he told me, this is happening to me out of everybody. And he didn't only tell me that. He told me that my cousin also is with child. Remember Elizabeth? Elizabeth and Zacharias. You remember that? Now they're old and they're coming. She's also pregnant. But he didn't believe her. 
He did not believe her, and he had the mindset to put her away. Put her away. She's crazy, and she should be put away because she thinks that God came and spoke to her, overshadowed her, and how many people will tell you? God told you what? Be very careful who you tell and what you say. Because not everybody will be overjoyed and thrilled, especially if the favor of God rests upon you and with you. You got to be very careful who you share things with. But she loved him. And she believed him. And she said, oh, certainly anybody, anybody, out of everybody, he'll, he'll believe me. But he didn't. He didn't until God himself came and said, you got to believe her because it's true, Joseph. It's true. So she makes haste, man. She makes haste. She leaves where she is. Yeah, I'm going to Elizabeth's house. i got to go see this for myself. I know what's happened to me. Now the angel has told me the same thing has happened to her. I've got to go and see for myself. And so she goes, she makes haste from where she is in Nazareth down to Bethlehem where they lived in the hill country, which was some great distance away. It wasn't just like hopping in the car and taking a ride. It took a little time to, to get there, but she went as quickly as she could. And it was of the essence that she went quickly because if you know anything about the geography of that region and of that area, at the end of that month, the rainy season comes. And so you've got to be, I mean, you don't want to be on the road traveling during that time of year. Shepherds are not abiding in the flocks and all of the rest, and, 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 and it's beginning to be winter, and that's the rainy season, and it's not a good time. It's stormy, and, and you just do not want to be out in any kind of weather traveling during that time of year. So she quickly goes. The Bible says she's, she goes, and she's with Elizabeth for three months. And when she sees Elizabeth, the two of them greet, and the two of them, <laughs> a little more, <clears throat> the two of them meet, <clears throat> and they look at each other. She entered the house and saluted them, and when it came to pass, Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary. What happened to the babe in her stomach, the minute that Mary salutes and greets her cousin, the minute they come together, the minute he hears her voice, he's filled with the Holy Ghost in the womb, in the fulfillment of the word of God. He is filled with the Spirit. That child. John the Baptist, who is now, she's six months pregnant. And he's in the, is it the last trimester? Is that what they call it? Like the, the sixth through the ninth month? Is that the last trimester? Is that right? Yeah, I think so too. I'm not a doctor, but I, I was there a few times. <coughs> so I remember that. That's that last trimester. She's going into that last trimester. This is the hardest time, Right? You know, she's like the biggest, and, and you know, you got the, never mind. <laughs> All of the crazy things going on, right? And here she comes waddling out, you know, and, and here they greet. They greet, and the baby is filled with the Holy Ghost. And the scripture just comes alive, and, and uh, she says, Elizabeth speaks, and, she, and Elizabeth says, Blessed art thou among women. See, she prophesied. And the Spirit of God comes over her, and then the Spirit of God comes over Mary, and they prophesy the Word of God. 
Isn't it wonderful? Can you imagine that God has chosen? Can you, I can't imagine that conversation. We get a little glimpse. But can you imagine what those next three months would have been like? Praying together, crying together, thinking, what's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? What an awesome privilege. But what a great responsibility. You got, you got a prophet, probably the major prophet of all the scripture. The mother carries the, the prophet, and the other one is carrying the Messiah. <laughs> and the two of them, they must have had, boy, that must have been some high tea. <laughs> I would have loved to have been there among some of that conversation. But can you imagine? And that's the time of year that we're looking at, brothers and sisters. This is when it all started. At this time of year, during the Feast of the Dedication. It's also called the Festival of Light. Because like John said, the light has come. He is that light. In the beginning was the word. Jesus was not just a baby who was born in a manger. He is much, much more. He existed long before he came. John tells us he was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Nothing was made that was made apart from him. Hallelujah. In him was life. Hallelujah. And in him was the light of men. Hallelujah. It was in the mind and heart of God. We've got to do it as the foundations of the earth before they are ever laid. Purpose, God, purpose within himself. We've got to make a way because this, you know what's going to happen. Jesus, who is the word, said, I'll go. I will go. I'll go. And the light shined in the darkness. And the darkness could never comprehend it. Arise. Shine, Isaiah says, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. This is what he's talking about, prophesying about that very time, the coming of the one. During that feast that is called the festival of light because God, God, keeps his word. And he is the light that shines in the darkness and in the darkest hour when you think all hope is lost, he'll come through. How many of us in our lives, in the darkest, deepest, most despondent times in our lives, I know it was for me when I cried out, desperate, because I had tried everything else. And I found nothing else satisfied. There was a longing and a desire deep inside of me that only one could touch, only one could feel, only one could heal. And I remember that day when the light broke through the dark in my life. He is the light that lights every man's heart. He's the light that shines in the darkness. And that's what the Feast of Lights, the Festival of Light, that's what it's really all about. Because the light shines 
in the darkness. And there's a richness to the Word of God. See, the Word of God tells us exactly when Christ came. Exactly when Zechariah was in the temple. Exactly when John the Baptist is born. She goes three months from that time. December, now it's March. And just after the baby's born, she leaves her cousin because now it's spring. Rainy season is over. It's safe now for her to go back. And now she is three months pregnant and probably beginning to, you know, show. And so she's got to quickly go back. She's got to go back. I got to go see what's going on with Joseph. I got to go back to my family. Not knowing what she's going back to. But she knows uh, it's been wonderful these three months, but now it's, here's the reality is setting in. I'm carrying, and I'm beginning to show, and i got to go back. And I'm not sure what I'm going back to, but i got to go back. It's time. The baby has come forth. The baby has been born. Three months later, in March, on another feast, because God is very particular about everything that he does. Have you noticed that about God? He is very particular to the, to the greatest and minutest detail. If you didn't know that about God, you should learn that about God. He is very detailed and purposeful in everything that he does. And on another feast, it's now Passover, and John the Baptist is born. And we have Josephus who tells us that John the Baptist is born on Passover. But we didn't need Josephus to tell us because God already did. And we need to believe God and follow the Word. The Word tells us, why is there so much confusion about when is Christ really born? When does it really take place? Should we be doing this? Should we be doing that? the word? Follow the word. Hello. Follow the word. The word will tell you. It's now March. Count ahead six months. September, there's another feast. Hello. There's another feast. <laughs> another holy day. And now it's the Feast of Trumpets. Because the trumpets are going to sound and herald His coming. Hallelujah. His coming. Oh, yeah. On the same day when they celebrate the first Adam, the second Adam comes. Isn't that amazing? Remember God, Paul said that in the Word? He's the second Adam. Do you know why he said he's the second Adam? Do you know why? <laughs> you should know why. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And on the very same day, they are celebrating creation, the crown and glory of God's creation. Here comes the word, the fulfillment of the promise. Here I am, the second Adam comes forth. That one who's been prophesied about. September, during the Feast of Trumpets. And he'll come again on that very day at the last trump. That's for, for another sermon. <coughs> Hallelujah. But the Word, the Word of God shows us. So then why do we get so caught up in the things of the world? You know what really Boils my oil. <laughs> How we are so gullible in the church. And why we give ourselves to things of the world when there's such, so much richness in the Word. As if we, we have to, it's as if Jesus isn't good enough all by himself. We got to add this and this and this. A whole bunch of junk. 
whole bunch of trouble. We got to crowd him out. It was orchestrated by the enemy. We hate the Jews. We hate the word. So let's just change things up. We want the pagans to come into the church. But we want to make it palatable for them. We want them to be, feel it, God forbid, should anybody feel under conviction and they come into the church, right? We want them to feel like they're at home. That they can come in as they are and stay as they are. And instead of getting rid of your idols, instead of coming out of the world, just bring it all in. Bring it all in. Big feast, festival, during Jesus' day. One that was ancient. From Babylon, Saturnalia. Go look it up. <laughs> Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 10. Talks about the importance of us fleeing from idolatry in verse 14 in particular. 1 Corinthians 10, 14. He says that we are to flee any hint of idolatry. Run away from it. Keep away from it. Not that the idol, he says, is, is anything in and of itself because we know there are no such things as other gods. There's no other god beside our god. There's, a, there's no false gods, false deities, no. But Paul makes it very clear to us. Paul makes it very clear to us in 1 Corinthians 10 that there are demons behind the scenes. They're the ones who are pulling the strings. Because they hate the truth. They hate the truth and they want you to come under delusion. They don't want you to hear the truth because the truth will set you free. They don't want you to walk in truth because then God's power and anointing will rest on you. And if God's power and anointing rests on you and you're walking in the truth, then the grace of God will be extended in your life and if the grace of God is extended in your life, God will empower you and equip you. And that means he's done. So I've got to keep them in bondage. I've got to keep them in darkness. I've got to keep them enslaved and ensnared. So that rather than give up your sin, just bring it in. And that's exactly what they did. And it's the sin of the church. Not the early church. Because the early church did not celebrate the birth of Christ. In fact, Jesus himself said to remember his death until he comes. Because I'm sure that he knew what the, they would do with celebrating his birth. They would make it this big thing. And, and it always goes back to just the babe in the manger. And he's not just a babe in a manger. He came to give himself on a cross for you, for me. He came to give himself for us so that we might live. He came to die in our place. On the cross. That is the message of the season. That's the reason the light came. That's the reason that he broke through in our hearts. That's the reason the light shines in the darkness. But the enemy brings trickery and deceit. And so much so that today we come down to today and we don't know truth from a lie. We don't know what's holy and what's profane. We don't know what's truth and what's not truth. And what's heralded as truth is not truth. 
Jesus was not born in December. Tell the truth. I'm waiting for somebody to stand up and tell the truth. And that's what God told me. If you're the only one, then be the only one. If you're the only voice, then be the only voice. Stand up in your day. Be Jeremiah, who stood up in his day against everybody else. They threw him in prison. Be Isaiah, who said, I get a glimpse of your glory, God. Send me. He said, I'm going to send you to these people, but they're not going to hear your words. They're not going to listen to you. Their, eye, their ears will become heavy. Their eyes will become dim. They won't adhere to your words. They won't believe your report. But you got to go anyway. And you got to tell them anyway. If you're the only voice, be the only voice. You've got to stand up in this day. In this day of delusion and deceit, you must stand up for what is right and stand up for the truth. no matter what anybody else thinks or says, because it will be the truth that sets us free. And we are people who are to adhere and follow the truth, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And life is in him. Hallelujah. 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 We must come out from among them and show by our works that, that we've been called out from darkness into his marvelous light and be a light because we show forth that great light. We're reflections of his glory. God has called I us. What a wonderful time Lord, I to be alive. Because of who you are. Men and women who love the truth, Lord, I adhere to the truth, follow after the truth, and we will reap all are. the benefits that his word proclaims. We will be everything he has called us to be. Just like all of those who went before. God is calling us in our day to take our place. Who will go for me? Who will stand for me? Who will speak for me? Against the delusions of wickedness and all of all of the, the false and all of the pretense and all of the other stuff, who will stand and be a beacon of light? And trust fully so that we see and walk in the glory. Like all of those who went before, God's calling us to take our place. Zechariah, take your place. Elizabeth, take your place. That which you thought was dead is about to come alive. God's about to come on the scene, Mary. Not going to be anything like you thought. Joseph, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Stand up in your day and be what I've called you to be for my honor and my glory against and in spite of what's around you.
you'll see the glory of God and walk in it. The power and the anointing that comes from him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. God bless you tonight. Father God, our hearts tonight are challenged by your word. Challenged by your presence, Father. We sense that you're speaking to us, and I pray, Lord God, every one of us would have ears to hear what the Spirit says. You're calling forth a people who have not bowed their knee, who have not given themselves, who are still faithful. Yes, in this Laodicean generation, there will be a remnant who hasn't bowed their knee or given themselves or chased after the things of the world. But Father, you called us out into your very presence so we can receive from your hand walk according to your truth and we know Father God because your truth sets free and we all benefits of that freedom for your word has broken through the darkness in our lives and you have brought us to the very place where we find ourselves today we are nothing without you we know that you're with us. So, Father, we pray, do whatever you will in our hearts, in our lives, so that we come to fruition, so that we, Father God, are everything that you have called us to be, that we would do everything you have called us to do according to the grace that you have poured out upon us. We give you glory and give you majesty. We honor your name. We love you, Lord, and it's a privilege to be yours, to be called by you. Bless us, Father God, as we go forth from this place. Be alive in our hearts and in our spirits, I pray, oh God. Take us into that place of communion where we're before your throne. You're speaking into us. And your word is flowing in and through us. Your presence and anointing is carrying us so that we can be a light to New Bedford and all of this area. So that others will see your glory and desire what's in us. For there are many who need you. And we must be the light must be the salt. And what to us if the salt loses its savor? Help us, Jesus, to remain faithful and to remain true and to hear and adhere. Hasten. Hasten to you. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen.